Presentation of Mo is Shy. I used to think democracy a quixotic quest, now merely Sisyphean. In this special edition of Democracy Here, we present a two hour docudrama based on the Portland Christmas tree trial. Judge King has not released transcripts from the trial, and this script follows closely my court notes. Listen carefully for four or five clues adding up to reasonable doubt that there was even a fake bomb in the FBI's white van. Here's Mo is Shai, narrated by Shahid Hamid. The Mark O. Hatfield Courthouse is located at 3rd and Main in downtown Portland, directly across from the library and medical tents of the 2011 Occupy camps. Every occupied day, a father marched in front of the courthouse with a bullhorn and cried, Free Mamumba! Free all political prisoners! and a boy called Nameless followed him with a drum. Now a young man stands accused of using the U.S. postal system in furtherance of an attempt to use a weapon of mass destruction. The trial starts with the opening statement of Prosecutor Evan Bishop. Prosecutor Bishop, your opening statement. On November 26, 2010, the day after Thanksgiving, thousands of American families attended the Christmas tree lighting ceremony at Portland's Pioneer Square. Little did they know that this defendant had been plotting and scheming for several months to murder them all. The government will present evidence showing that he was intent on violent jihad long before contact with the FBI. He wrote articles for the online zine Jihad Recollections. He felt justified in killing Americans, and he already selected Pioneer Square as his target. The FBI got involved when the defendant's father called to say his son was brainwashed and heading for violent jihad in Yemen. Given this warning, the FBI needed to assess the defendant to see if he was just talk or a real threat to America. During the assessment operation, the FBI kept giving the defendant a way out, but he was determined He kept completing tasks, including mailing electronics across a state line, viewing a test explosion, and renting a storage unit. He was resolved to commit violent jihad in America, and to prove it to the world, he made a goodbye video. The first undercover contact was on July 30th, 2010, with FBI Special Agent Youssef, posing as an Al-Qaeda recruiter. At this very first meeting, the defendant expressed his justification for killing Americans and his long-standing desire to make war on the West. On August 19, 2010, the defendant met with FBI Special Agent Hussein, posing as an Al-Qaeda explosives expert. At that very first meeting, Hussein learned that the defendant had been thinking about violent jihad since he was 15. Hussein then only asked him what he wanted. The defendant replied that he wanted to blow people up at the Pioneer Square Christmas tree lighting. He just needed a little help getting things together. On November 26, 2010, FBI special agents picked up the defendant and took him to the van with a bomb. It was made by law enforcement officers to look real and capable of killing thousands of Americans. The defendant picked out the parking space near Pioneer Square. The defendant flipped the toggle switch on the bomb. The defendant dialed the cell phone detonator, thinking that he was killing thousands of Americans. When it didn't work the first time, he dialed the cell phone a second time. Then he was arrested, and Portland was safe. Public Defender Monet, your opening statement. On November 9, 2009, the defendant had just turned 18, had taken no action, and had made no statements about violence or jihad. On this date, the FBI contacted this vulnerable youth and initiated their tried and true procedure for entrapment. The defendant was just a regular kid. He was brought up in the U.S. since he was three, He was involved in mainstream college culture, studying, partying, sometimes drinking too much, and sometimes smoking too much pot. He was active on the internet, where he did express unpopular opinions. However, he was all talk and no action, until the FBI got involved. 
In November of 2009, over a year before the fake bomb scare, an FBI operative posing as an al-Qaeda recruiter, Bill Smith, first tried to entrap the defendant. Smith was running an email phishing scheme out of Portland's JTTF office and tried to lure in the defendant. <clears throat> this operative first introduced the idea of taking action in the West when he wrote about how easy it would be to bring any American city to its knees. Although the defendant replied that he wasn't interested, Smith did file a report describing the defendant as conflicted and sad. Being a conflicted and sad teenager is not predisposition to crimes of mass destruction. Yet, the FBI persisted. Their second entrapment attempt involved several agents, and still, the defendant did not respond. He did not show any interest in taking action. On June 7, 2010, FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. gave local agents the green light to target the defendant and use everything they had on him. The full forces of the FBI focused on an immature and troubled 18-year-old. Entrapment is an important defense, and this time the FBI simply went too far. Court adjourned until 9 a.m. The morning started with legal wrangling about discovery of evidence. The judge seems to decide what is allowed based on whether it is more probative than prejudicial. He also gave the government until Wednesday morning to turn over documents from August, September, and October 2010 FBI strategy meetings. At 9.20, the jury was seated and sent the judge a note which he read out loud. Dear Honorable Judge, the jury would like a written definition of entrapment so we can keep it in mind while we listen to the deliberations to help us determine the evidence. Let's proceed for now. Call your first witness. The government calls FBI Special Agent. Milton Trust is to the stand. How long have you been with the FBI and in what capacity? I've worked 12 years for the FBI, cyberterrorism, counterterrorism, narcotics, a variety of cases. When did you get involved in this case? The FBI started this investigation when the defendant's father contacted us in September of 2009. What was your role in the investigation? I was in charge of undercover operations. I crafted emails, planned the face-to-face -face meetings, and participated in post-meeting debriefs. Who was the defendant's overseas contact? He was in email contact with Amro al-Ali, who was wanted by the Saudi government on terrorist charges. Object. Hearsay. Overruled. What does this email mean to you? It looks like Al Ali is recruiting the defendant for violent jihad. Object. The witness is guessing. Overruled. He said it looks like. Al Ali is recruiting for Al Qaeda in Yemen, and the defendant wrote back saying, Just tell me what you want me to do. It also made me nervous that they didn't use normal email, but developed a covert way of communicating. They shared a single email account and exchanged messages in the unsent folder. Would you call this a Dropbox? Yeah, this was a Dropbox, and it shows that the defendant was sophisticated in spycraft. Object. Hearsay. Overruled. In June of 2010, do you set up undercover operations? Yes, the defendant was trying to reach out. Object. Speculation. Overruled. He was reaching out to dangerous people, including Samir Khan, the publisher of Jihad Recollections. Khan was later killed in a U.S. drone strike. Object. Sustained. Disregard that last response. What was the goal of the undercover operation? The goal of the undercover operation was to assess a terrorist threat. The first action was to draft an email. Agent Chin, out of the San Francisco office, helped write the first ones in the role of Yousef, an al-Qaeda recruiter. Can you read the defendant's email response? It says, I have been betrayed by my family and now I can't travel. And what does that mean? Object. The email speaks for itself. Overruled, it is important to know the mindset of the agents. It means that he will cut ties with his family and wants to fight for the cause. That's why we go ahead with the investigation. We sent another email from Yousef setting up a face-to-face -face meeting. What does this next email mean? This is the defendant's response. 
He wanted to meet at his mosque. The FBI doesn't go into mosques, so we emailed back and moved the meeting to downtown Portland. And how did the defendant respond? Uh, he agreed to meet downtown and added that he was going to check me out to make sure I wasn't a spy. Did that make you nervous? Yes, we thought he must really be radicalized to be thinking of spies. Do you recognize this issue of jihad recollections? He shows the cover image of the Twin Towers in flames and a grinning Osama bin Laden. Yes, the defendant wrote an article in that issue. What did that make you think? He wanted to be like Osama bin Laden. Were you involved in planning the first meeting? Yes. Was there a plan to give the defendant four options? That's right. The options were designed to test his mindset.